Hi everyone, welcome to this Goggle Docs episode, which is actually a breaking news episode, uh, looking at the step one study. Um, and we're gonna give you some more details about that in just a moment, but Patrick and I uh, are representing the Goggle Docs team here today, but we're joined by a very special guest, uh, our friend and colleague, Sarah Davies. Sarah is a primary care colleague of ours, uh, who we know from uh, many interactions in the field of diabetes. Uh, in fact, Sarah had to put up with me screaming like a baby on a roller coaster not too long ago. So, uh, uh, so we go back quite a few years and it's great to have you with us, Sarah. Thanks, Amrit. Absolute pleasure to be here uh, with you both. I've been really envious watching the Goggle Docs discussions over the last couple of weeks, uh, almost like we're really together in person and having these uh, these chats. So I've been really envious. So it's lovely to be invited. Thank you. Uh, yeah, my name's Sarah. I am a GP from beautiful South Wales. I'm a partner at a practice in Cardiff. I've got a special interest in diabetes, but also medical education. I'm an MB Medical Hot Topics presenter and I love uh, primary care education and upskilling and making our colleagues feel confident in good quality primary care. Brilliant. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks for that. Um, uh, and obviously, you know, myself and Patrick, we're not going to introduce ourselves again. Um, but let's, let's get going with this, um, this announcement that's just come uh, for the step one trial, which is part of the step program, uh, looking at the use of semaglutide uh, GLP-1 agonist um, as a uh, anti-obesity treatment. Uh, and the step one trial results were just, just uh, um, announced and released. And uh, so that was using semaglutide as a high dose semaglutide. Now we're used, in, used to using semaglutide uh, at a maximum dose of around one milligram actually in primary care for the management of type two diabetes. But here it was using it at a higher dose in patients who didn't have type two diabetes uh, but did have obesity. Uh, and uh, the study uh, was conducted just over a year uh, and some very impressive results in terms of weight loss. Uh, on average, uh, we saw a weight loss of about 15% in those patients who were using semaglutide compared to placebo. So Sarah, uh, I know you tweeted about this uh, as, uh, as soon as the results are out and uh, you're hot off the press there of that. What really stood out for you in terms of the the trial itself, perhaps a little bit about the, who they were looking at, what they were looking at, and then what the results were as well. Yeah, no, I, I did. I'm not a great tweeter. I'm trying hard. I'm not a great one, but this did catch my eye because I think the results were pretty striking. I've been had a sort of increasing um, interest in, in looking at obesity management over the last few years. You know, we know the complexities around it. Um, and I think it's really emerging that it's much more a sort of chronic disease, isn't it? With so, so much to consider uh, that contributes towards it and what we need to think about in terms of individualizing uh, management of obesity, as well as, of course, the, the effects it can have. So I thought it was it was fascinating. So yeah, reasonably a sized trial, just under 2000 patients. As you said, nobody with diabetes. So a very different use of GLP-1s than where we are used to seeing them. Um, and patients were all in the overweight or obese category. So all BMI over 30 or over 27, but with other obesity related conditions. Um, and they were randomized to either have subcutaneous semaglutide and that very high dose. So we're used to giving up to one milligram, aren't we, a week? This was 2.4, so a real decent dose of semaglutide uh, versus placebo. Um, and they all had, really important, I think, to mention that both groups had lifestyle intervention. So they all had, I think it was a, a week, a four weekly one-to-one -one session supported to maintain a low calorie diet with, I think, a calorie deficit of about 500 calories and aiming for 150 minutes of exercise a week. So that was in both groups. And I think that's really important to, to mention as part of the trial. Um, and they had followed up for, I think, was it 68 weeks, as you say, about a year, year and a bit, something like that. And uh, yeah, the results were, were, were pretty impressive. You already kind of summarized them a little bit there. Um, so the mean uh, weight loss, yeah, so 14.9%, I think, of body weight was the mean loss. But what really struck me was the uh, number of people that actually lost more. So just over a third of people in the semaglutide group actually lost over 20%, which is pretty amazing numbers, isn't it? Um, 
and, and that was considerably more than, than in the placebo group. I think it was just over 1% in the placebo group that managed that kind of level of loss. Yeah. Uh, so significant loss and therefore really making potentially really big differences to these people. That, that's similar to what you'd expect in bariatric surgery. You know, it's starting to get to that, those sorts of uh, figures, isn't it? Um, so yeah, very, very impressive. It's interesting you mentioned also, Sarah, and I think we'll pick up on this in a minute, about the lifestyle program that was running alongside this as well. Um, but I might just turn to Patrick, uh, see what your thoughts were, any kind of things that struck out, uh, that stuck out for you? Yeah, I mean, I, well, I think the, the headline figures in terms of that weight loss, as you say, this, we haven't seen this sort of weight loss. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, mind blowing. It, it, we normally see these sort of, when you're looking at, 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 at categories of weight loss, we sit, we normally used to looking at 3%, 5% and 10%. And so, you know, 15% and 20%, we just don't see. So, so this is, yeah, so, I, and I would agree with you, we are, you know, in the same ballpark as at least some type of bariatric uh, procedure. So, so this is uh, groundbreaking. I would absolutely, uh, I think this issue about, it wasn't just a drug, um, but it's be worth bearing in mind that the placebo group and actually the placebo adjusted, you know, that there was a, the combination of this uh, this drug plus that sort of support seems to be the sweet spot. We've seen some of this stuff in other trials. We've seen evidence that um, semaglutide plus exercise seems to be particularly good at, at, at maintaining weight as well as as, as improving that weight. So um, yeah, impressive. It, it, the fact it's a year is is good. Well, it's a year on treatment. The, it, the, the titration takes some time. It's a, a month at each of the dose steps. But it's only two more dose steps from what we would be used to, um, so I was I was very impressed with that. Um, the uh, I mean adverse effects. So I think there there were adverse effects, uh, but they seem to be what you would expect with a GLP one receptor analog. Um, I, you know, going back to that degree of weight loss, the, we we have other drugs which are now approved by Nice. Um, uh, so with Saxenda, which is three milligrams of loraglutide, so that's it can be given in specialized clinics, and I I wonder if uh, this is the place probably for the higher dose of semaglutide when it comes there, but not in general practice, but in specialized clinics, um, and um, but but you know compared to that, you know this this drug is is far superior. You're getting twice at least twice the weight loss compared to that drug. So this is the gold standard now in weight loss but in people with uh, living with obesity um, who don't want to have bariatric surgery. So um, it's, it's another tool in our box to, to treat people. Um, and I suppose as the name of the drug, uh, as the name of the program, it's semaglutide. So STEP stands for semaglutide treatment effect in people with obesity. Well, it certainly has an effect. So uh, yeah, it's a big thumbs up from me. Um, uh, there are unanswered questions, though, I suppose, in terms of the durability effect, what happens after a year. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but in addition to the weight loss we've seen, I suppose that it's something that Sarah touched upon, we know as GPs, we know that obesity isn't just weight. It's a whole load of other things. You know, people have sleep apnea, which can affect, um, uh, you know, their energy levels. Um, it, it, it is debilitating on joints. Um, you know, it's debilitating simply just to walk around. Um, you know, if if you if if you're uh, carrying so much extra weight, and so and the the improvement in quality of life, both in the physical domain, which I've seen in other studies, but also in the mental domain, which I've yeah. not seen before yeah. in the GLP-1 study, I think is you know it, we need you know this it's important stuff, I suppose. We, we, we perhaps we need to think more about those um, because. You know, this is this for the vast, the only a, you know, a minority of people discontinued. So for the vast majority, this this had a real positive change to their life. And we all know that if somebody, you know, is on board and they're doing well and they're fighting, you know, people may have battled for many years to try and try and try and lose that weight uh, and to see it coming off actually people are likely to tolerate some of those side effects, a bit of nausea and so on. 
is pretty tolerable if you can see that weight coming off and you feel better you're right and I think you're absolutely right Patrick I think the psychological effects of that are not to be underestimated by any stretch and I noticed from the study that the people who who did lose the weight also were able to engage more in the physical activity um, mm. and they actually recorded higher physical activity levels as a result of having lost weight and therefore being able to move more, but probably also feeling psychologically more motivated to do so as well. And I've certainly seen that in my own practice when people are, do manage to lose the weight, they, they become more engaged. Um, and it's so important, I think, to build those relationships in people living with obesity uh, and to support them to, to try and move forwards. And as, as Patrick says, another tool in our armory. I was interested just with our diabetes hat on just for a second to see some of the cardiometabolic markers as well improve. So although they excluded patients with diabetes, um, quite a lot had prediabetes, uh, just under half actually in the intervention group. And the great majority became normal glycemic at the end of the, the trial, which you'd expect with that amount of weight loss anyway. Um, but 84% or so in the intervention group that were in the pre-diabetes range became normal glycemic. And we know that the potential benefits that that has, you know, potentially many years down the line as well, in terms of morbidity, mortality, and cost saving as well, potentially for the NHS. Um, yeah, exciting study. It's not like me to be so excited about a study, is it boys? <laughs> no? um, but I do, I, I share your excitement on this one. No, I'm yeah, I, well, I'm, I'm excited as well, I think, uh, and there's lots more to come as well. There's a whole program here mm -hmm. of trials of high dose semaglutide in this, um, you know, this uh, sort of cohort. I, I'm, uh, I, I tend to temper my enthusiasm a little bit uh, when, when, when we come to these sorts of announcements, just because I, I mean, I'm very interested in that sort of research translation, translational gap between real world and research. Um, and so I just want to just have a bit of a think about that because obviously trial settings um, you know, lifestyle program as well, as you mentioned, Sarah, um, every four weeks, one-to-one uh, -one sessions. Realistically, in the real world, uh, where we are right now, I, I don't have that much access to that locally. Um, and, uh, and also I wonder about the interaction between the clinician and, and the patient as well, the extra time that would have been given, really important things that perhaps we do need to focus more on when initiating medicines such as GLP-1, but that time for counseling, you know, ensuring the patient understands that there, there possibly will be adverse events, but you know, how, to, how to tolerate some of those. Uh, I think that is something that will be very interesting to see and how that translates into real world. I don't know what your experiences are, um, perhaps Sarah, first with, with the you know, initiation of GLP-1s in general and that balance with adverse events, particularly thinking about the GI side. It takes time. It's not something that you can, you can just you know, start very simply in a, in a two minute conversation as you could many oral uh, agents. You know, it is a conversation you have to have. You know, none of these people will have been on injectable therapies because none of them had diabetes. So you've got to get over that hurdle of injecting yourself, uh, demonstrate the device, uh, so on and so forth. And absolutely, you're gonna have to counsel about the GI effects. So I suspect a lot of people have them to some stage um, where they may, they may resolve in the first few weeks of treatment in, in many cases, but I'll always go through those, why they happen and how people can avoid them potentially happening so small frequent meals and so on and so forth all that good advice um so time will need to be spent and i do absolutely share your uh, slightly muted enthusiasm about the fact that this is not real life is it and you're right in everyday clinical practice we haven't got somebody that can do a one-to-one -one with someone every four weeks uh, to support their lifestyle interventions um so that's why i suspect we will just like Saxenda, high dose liraglutide, probably see this used in a specialist setting, such as tier three weight management services, which we, where we've seen liraglutide. Now we've had a nice technology appraisal, haven't we, for uh, high dose liraglutide, Saxenda, to be used in tier three weight management for people with pre diabetes, I think, isn't it? And I suspect we may see this going a similar way because that's the setting where they have got access to that intervention, that support with lifestyle medication that time to be able to devote specifically to counseling, to support, to psychological support as well. Um, all of which, sadly, we are rather lacking in primary care. Patrick, any thoughts on, on bringing this into the real world? 
Yeah, no, I think the, the, uh, Sarah and you, yourself have made, you know, very, very valid points. I think I would add to that uh, um, the issue about Saxenda. It is, yeah, for the, just for those patients with prediabetes, because that's where you get the cost effectiveness comes in. You know, diabetes isn't a cheap treatment to condition, uh, uh, condition to treat rather. So if you can, if we can stop it, then that, that saves money. Uh, so, uh, you know, the data which uh, Sarah alluded to in terms of the proportion of patients with uh, prediabetes is, is really important. And I suspect that will be the target group. So I think the uh, um, cost is going to be a key key factor. We don't know what the cost of the, these higher doses are, so we can hope that they're not uh, uh, they're, they're going to be accessible for patients. Otherwise, what's the point? But, but I, uh, certainly uh, the company Novo Nordisk, which manufactures Saxenda, which also manufactures this, have, did a deal with the UK government to make sure it was Saxenda was uh, is available in, the, in, in, in its nice appraisal if it's been prescribed in a specialist clinic. I think on a positive note, uh, we are getting increasing evidence. There was some evidence uh, at, um, in terms of uh, group uh, weight loss um, uh, uh, virtually, I think, in the state. Um, uh, so, so actually, there is some evidence that it doesn't have to be one to one. It could be done by group. So I, I, I think it, it, it is deliverable. Um, but, but yeah, we, we know these are very highly motivated patients um, to go in a clinical trial. They're not the often the patients we see. Um, so it does require, I, I think, that, that specialist uh, clinic. Um, but just one thing, just in terms of that mental health, I don't know about, I've, I've got a quite an extensive experience of using GLP-1 and, and semaglutide. And, and one of the things which I, I get from a number of people, particularly younger people who often have struggled with their appetite. So these are often people with diabetes I'm prescribing, I'm not prescribing it, for obesity so it, there's that caveat but actually having control over their appetite is it is almost like freeing them from prison sometimes people are locked in by their experience of, of hunger and the guilt that comes with it if they've if they've got weight or, or health conditions like diabetes so i so i i remain excited about this i i think this is 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 real news um, as you say it's the first step of many steps within the step program but i await uh, episode two uh, some brilliant insights there from the both of you any final thoughts or have you laid it all on the table oh it's another tool in our armory isn't it you know we've got to think about individualizing care for people living with obesity and it's going to depend on that person sat in front of us you know what is going to best suit them for someone it'll be that intensive diet and lifestyle for some, it'll be bariatric surgery. And for some, it might be high dose semaglutide. Uh, but that's what I like, having options so we can give real individualized care. Brilliant. Patrick, anything from you? I can only just, I'm, I'm looking forward to episode two. Episode two, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Well, brilliant. Thank you so much, Sarah, for, for joining us today. It was really great to have you with us uh, and some wonderful insights um, into this uh, step one study. Uh, and as Patrick mentioned, this is literally step one of several steps that we're going to be seeing with this program, um, looking at high dose semaglutide in uh, patients with obesity. So um, really looking forward to seeing that uh, in the uh, coming, uh, coming months and years. Uh, but until then, uh, if you like what you saw, obviously, please do subscribe to the channel. If you have any comments as well, please do uh, post them on our channel and we look forward to interacting with you. But uh, uh, for now, goodbye and thank you very much. Take care. Bye.